Hello, my name is Lawrence Court from the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. I'd like to start by saying thank you to Medical Physics for World Benefit for inviting me to present at this webinar to you today. I'd also like to say thank you to Sarah Ashmeg and Ajit Bagwala for moderating the discussion later. So as, as you know, I'm going to talk to you today about automated treatment planning, a resource with potential benefits in both high and low income countries. Funding and conflicts of interest. So you'll notice throughout my presentation that much of my understanding of this topic has come from our own development of the Radiation Planning Assistant. This is a tool that we've started to develop with funding from the NCI and other places that you can see on this list here. And it's focused specifically on the needs of low and middle income countries. So the idea is we're developing automated tools in terms of contouring and planning as much as possible, we're deploying into our own clinic to help our own patients. And then we're also putting the same solutions into the radiation planning assistant, which um, we hope will very soon become available outside of our institution. So I'd like to acknowledge the project funding from the sources shown here. So thank you for that. So automation in radiation therapy. So radiotherapy is a very complex process, and that's why we need so many skilled and relatively expensive people to, to run the process. So this figure here shows a sort of overview of the whole process. So we start with evaluation and diagnosis of the cancer by the physician. When we know we're going to treat with radiation therapy, the patient comes into the department, we take a CT scan, the physician prescribes the dose to the tumor and also to the normal tissues, the maximum doses to the normal tissues. And then even in 2021, as you know, a lot of the contouring where we draw what we want to treat and also what we don't want to treat that's done by hand that can take several hours once that's ready that's then passed to the treatment planner that could be a physicist a dosimetrist or some other member of the clinical team they then decide on the beam arrangements they just they calculate the doses optimize the plan to give what they think is the best plan possible they then go back to the physician there's some iteration because of clinical compromises that may be needed in the plan related to doses to normal tissues and doses to the targets. There's some, typically there's some editing of the plan and eventually you come up with a plan which the physician approves. This then goes back to the clinical team. There's more, there's quality assurance. We check that everything is correct. That's over the physicist. There's lots of members of staff involved in that process. There's maybe a peer review process and eventually the patient is treated. So it's a very, you know, this is just a big picture. So as you know, it's pretty large and complex, lots of steps. So lucky for us, you know, automation is really on the way now, as I hope you'll, you'll see in my presentation. But what I've done now on this slide is to draw lines around all of the tasks that are really ready to be automated. You can see most of the tasks in radiation therapy treatment planning are really prime candidates for automation, especially using deep learning or other forms of AI. So that includes in red, the automatic contouring and planning tasks. So we can automate a lot of the contouring tasks already um, and the planning tasks as well. If we can do that very consistently so that they always come out in an expected way, then that can help reduce the iterations between the planner and the physician in optimizing the plan. So we can help speed up that process as well. And then finally, automated plan QA. So checking that the contours are correct, checking that the doses are correct, checking that the plan makes sense. A lot of that can be automated to support the uh, manual processes that, as you'll see towards the end of my presentation, are still extremely important. So potential benefits. So there are, this gives us a lot of benefits. So you can see that the process becomes a lot, um, there's a lot less tasks. And so that gives us gains in efficiency per patient. So we can save several hours of physician's time per patient, um, especially for the complex um, plans like head and neck, where there's a lot of structures that need to be drawn. We can save treatment planners time. So a lot of these plans can take a lot of time and especially in the iterations. And so we can save a lot of treatment planners time. We can also reduce handoffs, so just passing information between people can be, be reduced and that can also save us some time. Not only efficiency though, there's gains potentially in quality and safety. Um, in terms of consistency, so you know anyone who's listening into this presentation who's in radiation therapy will know that there's quite a lot of variation potentially in, in, the, in how 
um, people draw contours and how you do treatment plans between people or between institutions. So, so if you automate, everybody's really treated the same. So if that's a high quality, obviously we're aiming for high quality, but that can really help improve consistency. And it can also help improve quality of treatments, especially, for example, at an institution, if you don't see many head and neck cases, you're probably not as experienced in doing those cases. So when, when those patients come along, if you can use an automated tool, that may help improve the quality. At least that's the idea. Um, and then back to the handoffs again, every time you hand off information to somebody else, there's a risk of communicating incorrectly. So there's potential benefits. If you can reduce handoffs, reduce risk. So what am I going to talk about today? Well, I'm going to all of those things really. So we're going to start with automated contouring and planning and QA. So we'll talk about how all those things can bring benefits to radiation therapy. And then, and then we'll take a pause because, you know, we'll talk about all the benefits and the great things that automation brings to us, but there's also potentially risk. You know, when we make a change to the clinical process, what risks do we need to consider when deploying in the clinic? How do we mitigate those risks? So I'll talk about that. And then where does that leave us? You know, okay, these things are great. They're going to help us. When are we going to get them in our own clinic and what sort of, what can we expect? Okay, so let's talk about automated contouring. So we'll start with this. This is a little test for you. So make sure that you're all awake. Got two sets of contours on the same patient. Which one was generated by the machine? This is a slide from Mark Gooding. He likes to apply this Turing test where you show an AI set of contours and a manual set of contours and you say, which is the one done by the machine? And the idea here is that if you can't tell them apart, then the AI contours are um, competitive, if you like, with the manual contours. You're, not, you're probably not gonna have to do much editing and they're fit for clinical use. So just remember your answer. In this case, it's the one on the left. So they're very similar though, as I'm sure you'll agree. So we've had contouring in our treatment planning systems, automatic contouring in our treatment planning systems for many years, but our common experience, you know, anyone who's listening in on this webinar will know, you know, our common experience is we, we might use the automatic contouring tools in our treatment planning system, but typically we would apply them and often we'd look at them, it wouldn't be quite right, we'd have to make some edits. Sometimes it would be worse than that, we just end up deleting them and starting from scratch. So why is that and why is it different now? So this is what I'm trying to show in the, the two figures, the head pictures on the left. So the one in the top is a patient who's been contoured using atlas-based contouring. So atlas-based contouring is where you have an atlas of patients, you know, you know, maybe 10 patients, previously contoured, which you then deformably register to your current patient and then use, and then you pull the contours over, fuse them, and that gives you your final contouring set. That was the state of art really until just a year or two ago. And it works really well under certain circumstances, but when it doesn't work well, it's, be, it's situations like where your current patient, Mr. Smith, He's, his anatomy is somewhat different to your atlases. So it really relies on the atlas anatomy and your current patient's anatomy being similar. Head and neck, that's often true, but in this case, the, the neck was over tilted, unusually tilted. And so what happened with the atlas contouring in the top left, you can see that the, you know, the structures are basically in the right place, but they're not quite right. You know, you wouldn't be very happy with those eyes and, and the brain. You're gonna to wanna to do some editing before you pass that over to treatment planning. With deep learning, however, the, the, the systems learn with a lot of patients. We also add additional data. We do shifts and, and sometimes do deformations or rotations to really give a thorough learning to the deep learning. And then you end up with a much more robust tool. And so when you look at when I applied deep learning from DJ Re in our group to this, to this um, same patient, we get much better results. We're probably not going to do any editing there. So it works for normal tissues for head and neck, but where else? So in the top right, we have data from Carlos Guidinas um, for the lymph nodes in the head and neck, so the elective CTVs. And one of these sets of contours, the yellow or the orange, honestly, not, not sure which, but one of those is the hand-drawn and the other is drawn by the deep learning tool. And you can see we've got excellent agreements. So that's really ready for clinical use. And both of these sets of contours, the normals and the CTVs are in use in our own clinical practice right now at MD Anderson. On the bottom 
is another tool that we've put into the clinic, which is the automatic contouring for the female pelvis. That's a very difficult target for um, anatomy, rather for atlas-based contouring because of the variations between people. But you can see for the deep learning, you get rather good results for the different structures. What about other anatomies? Well, really, it's the same, the same story. So prostate on the left, we've got the abdomen in the right, which is a very difficult, um, difficult part of the body to automate. But in this case, Senji Yu from our group has managed to do this with NNUNet um, with just 40 patients in his training data set. And you can see that the data is coming out rather nicely. So does that mean it's going to always work? Well, it often, I would be tempted to say yes, except the answer is no. So on the right hand side, we have a case from Saleh Hernandez where she is applying um, deep learning and automated planning for pediatric cases. And so she took DJ Rhee's head and neck auto contouring tools and applied them to pediatric cases to see how well they worked. And in many cases they worked, but sometimes they didn't. And so you can see here for brainstem, chiasm, and the, the optic nerves and the eyes, it's not quite right. So, so you do sometimes need to create new models. And so that's just a warning that these tools are actually getting really good, but there are some situations where you have to be careful. So everything that I've talked about in the last couple of slides have been anatomical structures that, that you know, should be pretty similar from patient to patient. Um, what about gross tumor volume autocontouring? So that's, that's much more difficult depending on the target. And what you can see here our results from Sky Legay, who is trying to automate the, con the contouring of the GTV for palliative head and neck cases. And you can see um, here the red is the physician, the yellow is the automated. And on the, on the top row are three tumors that are pretty easy to see. Um, and for those cases, the auto contouring works rather well. But on the bottom, you know, the, the deep learning really has the same challenges as we do as humans in that when we've got foot poor visibility tumors, it's much more difficult to know what to do. And so you can see in this case, right, that the automatic tool is either not getting it quite right or drawing in the wrong place or just not finding the tumor. So, so you know, it works well in when it's really exactly what you might expect when you can see the tumor well, it works well, and when you can't, it doesn't. So one, one final example of auto contouring so I talked about automatic contouring of the lymph node levels, and that's when you, if you'd say I want levels two to four drawn, and then it draws them for the head and neck for the elective CTVs. But we can expect much more advanced models to come. And this is a slide from Carlos Cadenas, where you give it the GTV, and then based on the GTV and the nodal GTV, the primary and the nodal GTVs, and the disease type, it then figures out what you want for CTV one, two, and three. So it's much more um, decision-making as well as contouring compared to just the tools of today. So this is not out there in any product as far as I know, but this is the direction that we can expect to be heading. So deep learning auto contouring, it really is just around the corner. It's much better than what we're used to. It really does work in most situations, or there are some where it's not so, quite so good as I uh, mentioned earlier. You know, I'm talking about the tools from our group because that's what I'm most familiar with. But there are, um, since the last few years, there's really a, several commercial auto contouring solutions available. The treatment planning system vendors have also started offering deep learning based contouring. And also the scripting in the treatment planning systems is allowing some people to add their own if they have that, that skill. And then the radiation planning assistant, which I mentioned um, in the first couple of slides, you know, that's not out there as an as a actual system yet, but the goal of our group is to try and fill the niche where people can't afford the commercial solutions so that we can bring high quality contours and plans to um, other people throughout the world. Okay, so that was automated contouring. Next topic is automated planning. A lot of the automated planning uh, research and development that's gone on is really focused on advanced techniques like VMAT and IMRT. And that's what this slide is about. So there's various approaches that people have taken. One is knowledge-based planning, which is since you train a geometric model based on previous patients so that when you bring in Mr. Smith, your current patient, it looks at the geometry and it can give an estimate of the doses that you're expect to get to the different tissues. 
and you can use those estimates to feed your optimization algorithm. So uh, Kevin Moore's group at UC San Diego developed plans, knowledge based plans for a variety of sites and introduced those into the clinic. And this, the figure on the right I really like because that shows the effect of bringing that knowledge based planning technique into the clinic. So if you move from left to right on that figure, you're really just moving through time. And you can see, oh, and the three different rows are just three different structures. And you can see as you move from pre knowledge based planning to post knowledge based planning, two things happen. One is that you generally get lower normal tissue doses, so that's good. And you also get improved consistency between plans. And then in the radiation planning assistant project, we took the same tools, refined it a little bit for our own needs, put it into the radiation planning assistant, and then we went to a head and neck specialist cancer conference um, in Arizona, and we showed, we got 60 head and neck plan reviews from 14 different specialist radiation oncologists, each from a different institution. So we're interested in knowing, okay, it's great if you do this for one institution, but we're trying to do something that's scalable across the world. So what's the impact of different people looking at the plans, each with their own um, preferences and opinions. And so we showed these plans, to these 14 radiation oncologists, and overall the RPA auto plan, that's the knowledge base plan, was very competitive with when we showed um, them the clinical plans. So they didn't know which was which, we showed them both. And they, yeah, they were basically they're very competitive. I don't think we can say too much more than that because the radiation oncologists didn't have it information about particular patients, about staging and things like that. But at least we can say that the auto plan is competitive. We've also looked at whether this knowledge based planning technique um, works well when applied to different treatment devices. So on the left, we've got the same technique with the same optimization criteria applied to an Electa machine and a couple of Varian machines. And then on the right, we took this even further and we compared um, when we apply it to a regular variant machine to when we apply it to a cobalt 60 um, treatment device when we're using a compensator to do the IMRT. And you can see that the DVHs are all very similar. You know, you, can, you can't really tell them apart. So the same technique can be applied to a multiple, multiple different machines. So that's terrific when you want to take some sort of AI approach and then scale it to help people um, globally. So that, that, those few slides were about automation for advanced techniques like VMAT. But as you know, we don't treat everybody with VMAT or IMRT. We've got lots of more traditional techniques. And so a couple of years ago, Kelly Kissling automated the development of four field box for pelvis just using bony landmarks. So that's a very popular technique across the world. The technique that she used was to take the CT, use automated contouring to delineate the different bony structures, you then project those structures into the beam's eye view, and then based on rules, you can then create the borders. And so what she found originally was she had a success rate of about 90%, and the main failure point was difficulties with vertebral bodies, because you, you might think all vertebral bodies, look, everyone's vertebral bodies sort of look the same, but that when you start to look at it in detail, there's a lot of disease or compression, there's a lot of variability, and that gave our original technique some trouble, and that was because we were using the multi atlas contouring techniques that I talked about early in this presentation. More recently, we've switched those out for deep learning techniques, which as I said earlier, are much more robust, and now we have a success rate of about 97%. So it's a sort of traditional technique taking advantage of advanced artificial intelligence to give quite a high success rate in terms of automation. One of the challenges though that I think we're going to have when we start to actually put those techniques into the clinic, especially when we go and look and work with uh, many clinics, is that there's many different approaches to do the same thing. So this, this slide is just an example from Kai Huang, who is working on um, rectal cancer, automation for rectal cancer, and each column is just a different approach to treating essentially the same thing. And you can see that although the field shapes look very similar, there are some subtle differences. And I think one of the challenges we're going to have is when you take technique A to somebody who likes to treat with technique B, they may not, they may say, well, technique A is fine, but I don't want to use it. And so that's a challenge I think we're going to have moving forwards. For the four field box cervix cases that I talked about, we have one level of, of somewhat customization, I suppose, 
where we have some standard borders and that's what you can see on the left hand side but if you want to have a different superior border you can add a reference point when you upload your CT and that will give you a customized border so that's just one point it's very straightforward um, and hopefully we're hoping where different people like to treat to um, different vertebral body levels hopefully that will um, be sufficient we're also developing automation for whole brain this is um, this is a slide from Yao Zhao in our group and so for whole brain there's you know we've got a similar situation all the fields tend to look the same but there is some variation from person to person based on personal preference and so what we're trying here is to give lots of different options so that if you have a particular option you like to use different skin fascia or you like to use a different way of drawing the block near the eyes that we can accommodate that and hopefully that will allow us to scale the techniques um, quicker and easier to more clinics so this slide shows a level of automation for planning that is much more complicated and also somewhat riskier so this is treatment of palliative spine so the idea here is the physician would say i want to treat t9 and i want to treat one vertebral body above and one vertebral body below and then the automated algorithm would go and it would find t9 it would do the contouring and it would apply the fields which you know could be laterals or appa or, or what have you and so this you know that conceptually that's quite straightforward but the risk is higher because you know, as you know, one of the risks that we have when humans do this is when you say T9, I might not get it quite right and get it to T10. And so we're very careful about how we count the vertebral bodies. And well, the computers can have the same problem. And so the approach that Tucker Netherton is taking for this is he is taking, he starts with localization. So he's built a deep learning approach that automatically identifies uh, the vertebral body levels he then segments, that's step two. So now you've got all those different vertebral bodies segmented. And then he has a verification stage. This is really important because this is the stage where you hope to catch the, did you really identify T9 properly? And so what he does is he has a, a, an algorithm that does the same sort of things as before, but independently with the idea being, and I'm gonna talk more about this in coming slides, but the idea is that if you have two algorithms, if they both agree, they're probably right and that's similar to when we do a dose calculation right now we often then repeat that dose calculation either with some sort of hand calc or maybe a different software so the idea here is being applied to automated planning and then if it agrees then we give you a plan so so this this tucker has this all working and we're now trying to figure out the safest way of putting this into the clinic while mitigating the risk of an incorrect identification and then finally, for automated planning, you know, there's many, many tasks that we do in, in treatment planning. Some of them you think are, are, you might think are somewhat straightforward, but the thing is there's so many of them. So if you can aut automate them all and put them together, you can really make a difference to the clinical workflow. So this is just two, two examples here. One on the left um, is from Kelly Kissling, where she automated the, um, the beam weight calculations for the four field box cervix cases that I was talking about earlier. I managed to bring maximum dose down for most patients for those cases and then on the right is uh, work from Kai Huang where she is uh, automating field in field which you know field in field is conceptually is a straightforward process but when you do it by hand it takes some time and that's time that you could be using spent doing something else so here she's taken a field in field technique and applied the same technique to whole brain rectum and cervix and you can see that it's successfully bringing down the hot spots um, for all these cases. So that's potentially a time saver for us in the clinic. So that's automated planning. And I think you'll find, you know, automated contouring is definitely here. There's commercial companies out there. Automated planning, that's true too. Not quite to the same degree, perhaps, but it's definitely just around the corner. Automated planning is available in many of the planning systems to some degree. Um, scripting in the planning systems now is allowing us to automate some of our own processes so you can just write your own scripts to help speed up your clinical workflows and then there's also these partnered solutions where there are companies that are working using the APIs in the planning systems to really um, help automate those processes and there's just some examples of a couple of commercial solutions plus our own um, research work from the radiation planning assistant on this page
So that's auto contouring and auto planning. The next topic I'd like to talk about is quality assurance, because I think AI and automation in general has a really strong role with us to help us with quality assurance, ensuring that only the best and the safest plans get through to the patient. So let's start with, with contouring. So as we all know, contours are not always right. You know, if they're manual contours or if they're um, computer contours, they're, they're not always going to be right. And so we've been working on tools to try and verify the quality or, or at least the reliability of the contours. And so the idea here is very similar, like I was sort of alluding to earlier with the dose calculations, where you do your dose calculation in your planning system, you then export it to another software, or maybe you do a calculation by hand, but you verify those MUs. And so we're trying to apply the same sort of idea to contours and other parts of the planning process. So, and the idea here is if you've got two algorithms and they draw, they're independent and they draw the same thing, then, then it's probably right. But if they draw something different, they disagree, then one of them is wrong. It doesn't tell you which one's wrong, but it does tell you there's something wrong and that should be flagged to the user for further, um, further investigation. That's the same as the MU check. If your secondary calculation disagrees with your primary, doesn't necessarily mean the primary is wrong, but it does make you look at this a little bit closer to make sure there's not a problem. And so there's an example here for um, parotids where on the left, you can see there's two different algorithms. They both agree, so they're probably correct. And on the right, you can see there's some sort of distortion to this patient and the algorithms have had some trouble and they get disagreement. And on the right is an AUC of, of, of our approach where we're comparing the two algorithms using geometric overlap me metrics like dice or surface dice and what and um, the two different lines that you can see in the AUC are for di two different degrees of error so either small errors or large errors and what we found is that this approach is really quite good at catching large errors those are the ones that could be clinically significant so if you use those contours to create a plan the plan would be quite different or sufficiently different that it might do some harm to the patient or at least change their outcome. We're not so good, however, and that's what the, the blue line is. We're not so good at catching the small errors that are, you know, they may be, we can't say they're not important, but they're definitely not as significant dosimetrically. And so, so and this, this is just for parotids, but we're getting the same results with pretty much all tissues. So we can catch large errors, but not so good at small errors. We can apply the same techniques to verification of field shapes. So what you can see on this slide are field shapes that were automatically generated using the technique that I talked about earlier for bony landmark based four field box of, for cervical cancer. And what we've got is two algorithms. So one of the algorithms is the algorithm that I talked about before. The second algorithm is a deep learning based algorithm that uh, predicts the aperture shape based on the DRR. And what you can see in the top left is the situation that we usually have where the two algorithms agree rather nicely, and that's a pass in terms of QA. On the right hand side, there's two examples where one or other of the algorithms failed, and you can see that they would disagree and that would be flagged. And then you can see in the, the um, bottom left is a results from a series of patients where we ran the automated algorithm, we ran the QA, and we also got the primary algorithm scored by a radiation oncologist in terms of acceptable and unacceptable. And you can see we, we loaded this case with unacceptable cases, but the red ones are the unacceptable from the physician's point of view, the blue ones are the acceptable cases. And you can see the Hausdorff distance, which is a distance to agreement metric, quite nicely separates the acceptable and unacceptable beam apertures. So contouring and field shapes. You know, those are major tasks and you can see that those are really important in terms of their impact on the patient's treatment. But there's so many tasks in radiation oncology. You know, when you're checking a plan, there's so many things to check that could have been done incorrectly. So automatic verification can really help with all of these, I think, in the future. So this is just two examples that I put on this slide, but the left is um, the marked ISA center. So as part of the planning process, you have to find the marked ISA center so we can automatically check that. And we do that in the RPA project by having two algorithms that are completely different. And we just we use them both to find marked ISA center and then double check that they agree. And the same for the uh, body contour. You know, if the body contour is wrong, that could have an impact, quite a major impact potentially on the dose calculation. 
And so we also have different algorithms that we use for detecting the body app, the body shape, um, body contour, and then use that to um, double check that everything is going correctly. So as well as safety, we should also be thinking about quality. And so we're also looking at whether we can use AI and other automated tools to really classify or to flag plans that are, you know, they might be safe, but they may be not as high quality as we would like. And so the first work that we've done with this is uses knowledge-based planning. So it's the same technique as we're using for the optimization um, in VMAT, but we're using it here to identify plans that are subpar quality. And so the figure on the left is just showing how well the knowledge-based planning approaches can predict the doses for good plans. And so we've got the predicted dose, uh, mean dose to the protid on the y-axis, the x-axis is the mean dose from the plan. And you can see we've got pretty good agreement. So that's the starting point that gives us confidence that we can use um, this knowledge-based planning technique to predict the doses that we should expect for Mr. Smith, our current patient. And then what we've done is we've taken that approach we apply that to manual plans, and then if the plans have a higher dose than we predicted by a certain amount, then we flag that to the user. And so, and we've done this for a whole series of manual plans, and then we've compared the flagging from the automatic process with what we get from um, when we ask a physician to review the plans, and we're getting excellent agreement. And that's what's shown on the right-hand side. This is for esophagus. Um, the, the plans, the patient index, that's just like the patient number, is along the x-axis. The ones that are circled are the ones that the physician identified as being flagged. And this is all for cases that were flagged um, as having too high dose to the esophagus. And then you can also see the sort of pale lines going down. Those are the doses um, to the esophagus from the automated planning which was giving a lower dose um, than the manual plans. And so that shows that it's, we're not just flagging cases, we're flagging cases that could really could have been planned to give a lower dose. So it's a little bit uh, futuristic, but this is, I think this is the direction that we're heading with these, these sorts of projects. And then the next step really is to predict the 3D dose. And so several groups are trying this. This is data from Mary Gromberg in our group and she's predicting the doses for individual patients who are being treated with IMRT or VMAT. And this is just one comparison, but you can see the agreement between the predictions and the actual clinical plans is quite, quite remarkable actually. So the, on the left, on the top are the predicted dose distributions, the predicted plan, and then the actual clinical plan below. And then on the right hand side are the DVHs, but you can see we're getting really good agreement. And these are, she's trained this using plans um, that are considered to be good plans. And then the idea is that we're next, we're gonna take that, we can apply it to other plans. And if there's poor agreement, like if the manual plan is higher, then maybe that flags um, a plan that could have been um, maybe a little bit better. Okay, so, so QA in terms of safety and quality, I think we're really just around the corner for this and this being not as, it's not as close, I don't think in many cases as maybe the auto contouring is but we're really close to being able to use these tools to help make our processes safer and also more effective. And so these are just some examples on this final slide for the QA part of this talk, just giving some of the examples that I talked about over the last few slides. So, so you'll have noticed, I'm sure, that I've been doing something that many people do when we talk about AI and automation. We talk about how great it is. But what about the risk? What happens when we introduce these things into clinical practice? Well, one thing that we do is we reduce the amount of times that a person looks at the data. You know, you look at the data at the start, the plan or the contours are created, and if it's good enough, maybe there aren't many edits, at least that's the direction we're going. And then you look at the final plan. You know, normally in our current processes, there's many other people en route, you know, in the process that look at the plan. So what if we have a patient that looks like this one here? You know, we see patients like this with hip replacements. They give a bad CT image. We're also gonna have to do something different. We're gonna have to use different beam angles, for example. So we know that as a human, we're doing the plan. We would, you know, there'd be some discussion in the clinical team probably, like how are we gonna um, respond to this patient, give them the best treatment we can. The computer though, you know, that if they haven't been told to look for this, they're not gonna look for it. They'll probably still give you an answer pretty high risk though that it, it won't be the right answer and will be will be the wrong uh, plan. 
So we've spent a lot of time worrying about this sort of thing, doing uh, risk assessments, especially with failure modes and effects analysis. Now, I'm going to talk about some of the results for the FMEA. So let me just quickly describe it for anybody who's not familiar. It's really a process to identify potential failure modes and to score them in terms of their sort of risk profile. So you first look at um, all the different, you identify all the risks you can think of in all the different processes. You then score them in terms of um, how likely they are to occur. If they do occur, how bad an impact would it be, the severity? How bad would it affect the patient? And then detectability. So if it did happen, how likely are you to catch it, like in your QA, for example? And so there's just two examples given in this um, slide at the bottom. One is if you're marking a patient with three-point setup with external fiducials to mark for marked isocenter, like a slide I showed a few slides ago, and maybe you don't place all the slide, all, all of the fiducials. And so if you do that, you know, if even if in an automated or manual process, it's going to get caught because there's not enough fiducials, so you can't find marked isocenter. So there's no, no major risk to the patient because you can't move forward with the plan. It's inconvenience. Um, you might have to rescan the patient, for example, but it gives a low risk number because it, the effect is really inconvenient. It's also not very likely to happen and the severity is not going to be high. If um, you get the body contour incorrect, though, if the body's incorrectly contoured, that can have an, you know, it could be caused by something like inappropriate immobilization. That can have an effect on the dose distribution. And so, and it's also quite difficult to catch because you, unless you scroll through and look at the body contour for every single slice, and so that can have a bit a higher um, risk index, RPN, risk priority number. So when you do an FMEA analysis, one of the first things you have to do is map out your entire process. And this is um, our process map for a clinic that uses the RPA. And you can see there's all the, the, the blue processes are manual processes, the green are the RPA automatic processes. And you can see, you know, even though we, we we say we've done a lot of automation, there's still a lot of manual processes and approvals and reviews that have to happen. The next thing you do is you identify all the failure modes that you can think of. So we, we spent hours, we had a team of radiation oncologists, physicists, dosimetrists, therapists, um, and developers. We went through and we tried to identify all of the failure modes. The ones that we, list, we found are listed here, or at least um, categorized here, and you can see that contour editing, review and upload is one of the largest, it's not necessarily the most risky, but it is where there's the most potential sources of error. So I want to take a little bit of time over this slide. These, this is once you've identified all the failure modes, you then score them, as I said earlier, these are the ones that have the highest RPN. So they're really the highest risk profile. And if you, you know, you could start by just looking at the cause column, which is the third column. And you can see there's only, there's not much that's errors that are caused by um, incorrect algorithms. There's a lot to do with automation bias and operator error. So those are things that can happen um, because you're using the AI tools. They may not have happened otherwise, but like automation bias is what happens if you get so used to the results of the tool being good that maybe you, don't, you rely on them too much. And then operator error are where if, if error, if something is entered incorrectly by the user, of course, that, that's not the AI's fault. That can happen. You know, we're all human. We do enter things incorrectly. But um, this is just pointing out that when you use AI, some of these errors are still in existence. Another potential um, cause of error is what's called off-label use. So this is if you use, for example, if you use a um, cervix auto-contouring tool um, you say, well, I want to contour the prostate because it's got bladder, it's got rectum, you know, some of the structures are the same. Let me use the auto contouring tool for cervix because the prostate one's not ready yet. And maybe you don't get as good a result. You know, maybe the contouring's not as good or something else happens and that could cause an error. So at a recent symposium that we held uh, last month, we asked the participants, based on your experience, do you think off-label use is a real risk? And you can see the majority said yes. And then we also asked, do you think that's likely to result in a mistreatment of a patient? And, you know, only five of the recipients said no, the majority either said yes, or they were unsure. So I think off-label use is something we have to really um, be careful about. 
And that is something that we have very careful communication, training, and other checks in the system. There is good news though. So, you know, when you do an FMEA, you do end up in this sort of all doom and gloom mode, but there is good news. This is a results of a survey from the same symposium that I was talking about, um, collated by Kelly Nealon. He's asked, do you think introducing the RPA would add or reduce risk to your clinical um, workflow? And the vast majority said reduce risk. So that's good news. And this, you know, the symposium was about the RPA, hence the question. But really, this applies to other automation tools that you might be able to get from elsewhere or through um, commercial solutions. And I did want to show you this slide. This is a slide from Kelly Kissling. Um, showing the impact of introducing automated QA into the automated workflow. So if you've got something like the RPA that does automatic contouring and planning, and then you add automated QA to try and verify the plans and the contours and catch things, um, what's the impact on that on the risk profile of the system? And so the figure on the left is showing the number of failure modes um, for different detectability scores. So in this case, a detectability score of, of one means it's very detectable. So it's relatively low risk because you're very likely to catch it. And you can see that without the QA program, there's quite a few um, um, high detectability scores. So that's things that are not very detectable. And that goes down when you add the QA program. And then on the right hand side is the same uh, data, but with the risk priority number along the X axis. And you can see that the number of high risk priority numbers really goes down when you add the QA program. So what does all that tell us about how we should safely deploy these automated tools? Well, there's really four main things we need to think about based on these different risk assessments and other experience. So one is training. Training is really important. We've got to educate the end users about the tools, about what can go wrong, about the impact of those things that can go wrong. And especially um, when we consider things like automation bias and off-label use and the risks associated with that. So number one is training. Number two is automated QA. As I said, once we can automate some of the QA steps, it doesn't get rid of the manual steps, but it really just adds another level of um, safety. Manual plan checks, these are really important. So physician review of the plans and the contours and physics checks are essential components of automated treatment planning. So think about, that patient that I showed at the very beginning of the risk section with the hip implants, you know, we've got to make sure that we do proper checks to make sure, that's an extreme example, of course, but to make sure things like that don't get through. And then finally, careful commissioning. So careful commissioning and testing of your tools to make sure everyone in the clinical team understands the process and has um, appropriate expectations. Okay, so where does that leave us? And I feel pretty convinced that we can expect AI to touch all aspects of radiotherapy planning. You know, complex contours, complex plans, simple plans, um, GTV contouring, automatic labeling of vertebral bodies. You know, lots of examples given here, but I think all of these are really um, going to be available to most of us in the coming um, years. Are there hurdles? Yeah, sure, there are hurdles. Uh, we did a survey. Um, in South Africa last year, where we had people identify the different barriers that they could anticipate in terms of using the RPA, although this would be applicable to other um, software as well. So we, we did this as part of a usability session where we had different people run plans um, using the RPA, and then we asked them about the barriers. And so, you know, the things that came up are things like internet speed, because as is a web-based tool, um, the cost, you know, because a lot of the tools out there are commercial, so you have to upgrade licenses and things like that. And that's the niche that we're hoping to fill at some point. And then administrative in terms of um, PHI and things like that. So there are, sure there are barriers, but I think it's very likely that AI is very soon going to be in our clinics. So finally, in summary, so AI, as I said, is going to touch all aspects of radiotherapy planning pretty soon, I think. We've got to remember though that AI planning contouring isn't perfect. It's not trained for all scenarios. We do have to think about the risk and especially important are things like training, make sure everyone has, has reasonable expectations and knows how to use the tools and manual plan review. So although I said automatic QA is very useful, the manual plan review and QA checks are still going to be extremely important, possibly more important than they are now. 
But it's all very exciting. I'm really looking forward to the next few years. I think we can all really make a difference to radiotherapy and to cancer patients across the world. So this is my final, this is a thank you slide. So thank you MPWB for having me today and for giving me this opportunity. Thank you to everyone who uh, tuned in. Thank you for listening. I'd say thank you to the RPA team. This is one of our Zoom calls here. Um, all the people who did all the work that I presented today. And then especially thank you to all of our collaborators. We've worked very closely with a lot of place, people in a lot of different countries and we really hope to make a difference. So thank you to everybody.